Hello and welcome to episode 11 of History with James. And today we're going to talk about a subject it, that might sound familiar to some people and, and maybe not. Maybe it has nothing to do with the current age we're living in. But in talking about that, we're talking about, what are we talking about? We are talking about Rome. Now, for those who don't know, very quickly I will summarize a brief history of Rome and the different ages of Rome. Um, particularly, it's Rome starts as a uh, as a city state, and then it conquers all its Italian out. Uh, it conquers different Italian tribes, and begins to spread across uh, the Mediterranean and become an empire. Now, Rome first starts out as what we call a republic. That means it has a senate. Uh, it has a pleb, uh, a, you know, a pleb, who's, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, they have these speakers, or people that speak for the people, you know, the plebiscites, and there's a pleb, you know, who's the person who speaks for the people, and has some legislative authority, and then we get to Caesar, and, and why did the Senate kill Caesar? Well, it, it's, it's very, um, clear, as you see, the senators were afraid of losing power, and what does that exactly mean? That means that they were fearful that, that Caesar, who was a uh, dictator, now dictators were temporary back then, they were usually appointed by the Senate to go out and uh, take care of different military foes of Rome, and uh, Caesar had taken over Gaul, and um, many people feared that uh, you know he was very popular with the people, and that he in fact was going to uh, uh, you know uh, become a tyrant as the word Tyrannius, sic simpus Tyrannius, thus always a tyrant, um, would be the phrase, the Latin phrase against a tyrant, that a tyrant is somebody who uses the power and abuses it and lords over other people. In our case, it would be the Senate. And then they kill Caesar and his, uh, his adopted son, Octavius, I think it's Octavia of Julia, Julia, the Julius family, uh, becomes Augustus, and he becomes the first emperor. And after that, Rome is in, is in, um, is ruled by an emperor. It's three positions in one: a military leader, a political leader, and a, a spiritual, religious leader. So, today we'll we'll start about the third century. And. What we use is we you will use a source. I'll first spell it to you because I'm probably going to butcher the name. He's a historian of his period, and his name is A M M I A N U S. Okay, that's his first name. M A R C E L L I N U S. Arminius Marcellinus Marcellinus. That's, I think, how you say it. And he is the person who is going to guide us on our journey. We'll use his primary source document. Now, again, um, we'll point out when his source will be biased. And we'll use um, Ward Perkins, I think it's Brian Ward Perkins, uh, The Fall of Rome book, to supplement that also. So we begin. Now, why was Rome able to maintain power in an otherwise... Uh, a, a small group of people able to maintain power over such a, a big empire. And Arminius Marcel, Marcellinus Marcel, 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 Marcellinus Arminius Marcellinus wrote about a particular battle in the 300s in 357, okay, Emperor Julian defeated a force of Alamanians who had crossed the Rhine. And now, what we need to know about the Rhine, okay, this is oh, this is Ward Perkins we're using here. The Rhine was the cultural divide between Rome and what was Rome, and what was Germanic, the tribes of Ger you know Germanic peoples, and those included the Visigoths. Uh, they sometimes were just called Germanics. Uh, the Romans referred to them as barbarian, 
uh, barber meaning having a beard, going back to the Greek origin of the word, which is barbarous, which referred to the Athenians who were clean shaven, referred to the Spartans, their natural enemy. So you see right there, it's, it's usually a warlike type people that lives on plains and sort of mobile subsistence living. And why is Emperor Julian able to defeat these larger forces of dramatic tribes, the um, Alamans? I'll spell that for you too, just in case. A-L-A-M-A-N-S, Alamans, who, they were much greater in number, and the historical account makes it clear that Rome, Romans won because of their def, uh, defensive armor and formation of shields. Even though they were vastly outnumbered, they had were more trained and skilled. And Amenus Marcininus writes, in some ways, equal met equal. The Alamans were physically stronger and and uh, swifter. Our soldiers, though, uh, our soldiers, through long training, more ready to obey orders. Now, this this essentially sits up a uh, a picture of how the Romans maintained order over their empire. They were more disciplined. Than say these traditional warriors who um, you know were used to raiding and um, and open field battle and open formations and freeing, versus the Romans who used large shield formations and uh, discipline um, numbers to defeat much larger armies. However, Germanic allies were undisciplined fighters. So um, you know, sorry that that probably made no sense in the context. And the Romans didn't really necessarily view, you know, eventually the Romans began to rely on more of these quote-unquote barbarians for their own defense. And it's because they have a de uh, decrippling economy. The empire is simply too big to maintain order. And and it says, you know, however, the, you know, the Germanic allies were, were increasingly relied on for defense. And this served a certain purpose for the Romans, who said, Indeed, as one observer noted, the death of a barbarian in Roman service thinned out potential future enemies of the empire. Although uh, you would think that barbarians would, you know, because they were these technically potential enemies, that they weren't loyal. But uh, Wards Perkins points out that the barbarians were extremely loyal. In fact, a large portion of Rome's former enemies marched with the Emperor Theodosius against Magnus uh, Maximus in 388. In an invasion of Italy in 405 through 6 AD, Huns and Alans and even slaves defended the empire. The in, uh, this is a quote here. The empire s simply... But see what happens here is Rome increasingly, in order to defeat these invasions, yes, they used barbarians, but they also pulled soldiers out from the frontiers of the empire in Britain and in um, Gaul and, um, you know, North Africa and other places where they were sort of, you know, the, the border of the empire they were guarding against different enemies to defend its homeland as they did in, say, an invasion of 405 to 406. And this is what we eventually, per, Wards Perkins says, the empire simply did not have enough troops to maintain its frontier defenses up to full strength while fighting major campaigns elsewhere. Avoiding battle led to a slow attrition of the Roman positions, but engaging the enemy on a large scale would have would have risked immediate dis uh, disaster on the throw of a throw of a single dice. Now, this is what we're pointing to here. They simply just did not have, you know, avoiding battle led to a slow attrition of the Roman position. So, um, you know, but engaging the enemy on a large scale would have uh, risked immediate dis disaster on the 
throw of a dice. Now, so essentially, uh, the attrition, they were losing the war of attrition, but they weren't able to engage because it was very risky to engage their armies at this point because they just simply weren't strong enough. And Ward Perkins likens a lot of parts of why the Roman Empire fell. He doesn't really give a particular reason. He just refutes different reasons of why Rome did fall. And I will read from you a particular section. And, you know, again, Aminius Marcellinus is a good source because he lives during this time when the empire is in disrepair. And this is what we wrote on the question of 1A in Dr. Rosenfeld's class. I wrote on why the Roman Empire fell, according to Ward Perkins. And looking at the fall of Rome, Ward Perkins looks not at what caused the fall of Rome, but instead challenges the wrong notions about the fall of the empire. He challenges Peter Brown's theory of late antiquity, describing these types of thoughts as a much more comfortable vision of the end of empire spreading in recent years throughout the English-speaking world. He states that historians in this movement replace decline and decay with words like transition. Ward Perkins suggests that redefining, uh, redefining changes the meaning, saying transformation suggests that Rome lived on, through, though gradually um, metamorphosed into a different but not necessarily inferior form. Of course, this is like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Some people just refuse to believe an empire so great could fall. They refuse to taste the medicine. Another notion that eventually leads to this analysis is barbarians revitalizing the empire. Ward, Ward's Perkins uses the words of German philosopher Heder to, to frame such a theory. Barbarians came to perform th this office. Northern giants to whom the in 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 venerated Romans appeared doors. They ravaged Rome and infused new life into expiring Italy. Perhaps people argue that Germanic invaders contributed to positive changes. They had raided their way into Prakas from for the empire. Scholars point to change in military policy, where Germanic people were given lands and portions of tax revenue. The exchange they stopped at, uh, stopped attacks while defending the empire. Um, this is also a notion that we're we're getting into here, that the raiding of the empire actually revitalized the empire. It it brought new energy and revitalization. It, it's a sort of a scorch, scorched earth policy um, way of thinking, and that's how some of these scholars tend to think of um, this. And of course, Ward Perkins is being critical of these type of thoughts. Um, where dramatic people were given land in proportion of tax revenue exchange, they stopped attacks while defending the empire. However, Brian Ward's Perkins brings criticism to this thought. There is no hint here of invasion or force, nor even that the, the Roman Empire came to an end. Instead, there is a strong suggestion that incomers fitted easily into continued and evolving Roman world. While refuting, the, while refuting this notion, Ward's Perkins is quick to highlight his own position that German invaders ended the empire. In the mind of Ward Perkins, through his refutations, Germanic peoples were the physical manifestation of Roman decline. He clearly highlights this opinion in the opening of Chapter 2. The Germanic invaders of the Western Empire seized or extorted, through the threat of force, the vast majority of the territories in which they settled without any formal agreement on how to share resources with their new Roman subjects. Essentially, German invaders defeated the Roman Empire by conquest and thus ended the empire. They defeated the empire by pure chaos, not sustaining any permanent strategy and making Romans submit. Perhaps a poignant example comes from the treaty between a Roman government and the Visigoths. Now, the Visigoths were originally from Sweden. They were a group that uh, gradually made their way across the empire and sacked... Uh, Rome eventually and settled into what today what is Spain but uh, the, the Goths spread into two different groups the other group didn't really become as successful as the Visigoths and in fact the Visigoths were in the service of the Roman army in many cases which points to uh, their loyal service to Rome in the fall of Rome it is made clear that the treaty was uh, I'm sorry perhaps a pointed example comes from the treaty between the Roman government and the Visigoths in the fall of Rome, it is made clear that the treaty was only a footnote, considering the treaty that the Visigoths 
uh, considering the vast territory that the Visigoths conquered. The, Vi the Visigoths would conquer a large portion of Gaul in the Iberian Peninsula. Gaul is what is today uh, modern-day France, and the Iberian Peninsula is Spain, Portugal. Years earlier, the Romans would be have been able to put down such a rebellion. Now they were unable. In fact, Rome ordered those who resisted against the, the, the Visigoths in Claremont to surrender. Aminius Marcellinus account fits very well into the narrative of Ward's Perkins. In one section, Ward's Perkins uses a poem describing the invasion of Gaul between 407 and 409. Some lay as food for dogs, for many a burning roof. Both tried, both took their soul and cremated their corpse. Through villages and villas, through countryside and, and marketplace, through all regions, on all roads, in this place and that, there was death, misery, destruction, burning and mourning. The whole of Gaul smoked on a single funeral pyre. I would agree that this is not a literal count of the attack, but certainly a reflection of the feelings of the empire being sacked. This relates to Marcellinus' Marcellinus's account, because he is portraying the loss of empire and its effect on the people. Marcellinus would remark on the state of the empire as, but the magnificence of Rome is defaced by the inconsiderate levi 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 levidity of a few who recollect where they were born but fall into air and lucidness as if perfect immunity were granted to vice. In essence, they were both right at the fall of the empire, which they both recount. Rome, Roman people are no longer Roman and do not achieve the same nobleness leading to what happens in Gaul. Though Rome still stands, the empire is in disrepair, perhaps because Marcellinus was reasoning. So essentially, we started with Marcellinus, his own writing and own thought. And what he's, he, he, his first, first uh, marker at the beginning of this podcast is to mark uh, a glorious Roman, Roman uh, army on the field of battle. Uh, you know, taking and, de and and defending against a much larger force through its discipline and its military training. By the time we get to the end of the empire, as we look at here, we we see that Rome increasingly relies on um, foreign tribes, including Huns, Alans, um, Valens, Visigoths, and and other tribesmen to defend itself. It is if it is it is if that they have no ability to defend themselves anymore. They have to withdraw, as we discussed earlier, um, from other parts of the empire, on the fringe, uh, well, you know, where the Germ on the borders with Germanic um, peoples to defend um, themselves. And we, as we mentioned in 357, Emperor Julian defeated a force of um, Alamans who had crossed the Rhine. Now, the Rhine was the marker of um, civilization. Uh, the Rhine today separates. Of Germanic speaking peoples, of uh, just for example, Dutch, uh, I'm trying to think of some other Dutch, Danish, German, and other Germanic tribe languages. And you know, today English is spoken by um, our the ancestors of England were Anglo Saxon, they were a tribe on, on the um, what is now the Netherlands, and they crossed over into Britain. Versus, if you go across the Rhine, on the other side you have people who speak French, Spanish, Italian, well, Italians in Italy, modern-day Italy, but Spanish, Portuguese, and and those people speak a Romance language, which in, is has its root in Latin. So this is where we see the dividing of the empire. In 357, the uh, Alamans cross the Rhine, and... It makes the historical account makes it clear that Romans, uh, you know, won because of their, def, you know, their defensive armor, and formation of shields. You know, this is the height of the empire, where they're actually able to stop. You know, they were never able to conquer past the Rhine, but they are actually able to hold the Rhine. You know, as a barrier of the empire. You know, and he gives uh, a mini a mininess. Uh, Marcellinus gives this account, you know, that there's this, uh, you know, he compares them. They're both great, uh, great warriors, but he says, "What well, wins the day?" You know, he accounts what wins, what the Roman characteristics of a Roman army are. 
And, you know, we, we, we mentioned here too that avoiding battle led to a slow attrition of the Roman positions, but engaging the enemy was simply just not an option anymore because they just didn't have the troops and they had to close rely on people, uh, allies who lived on, you know, far away frontiers to defend its empire, as we have seen in different conflicts here. If we look at, say, example, the invasion of Italy in 405-06, Huns and Alans, even slaves, defended the empire. This is a far cry from our army in 357 with Emperor Julian. Now, what, what does this necessarily say? Well, Aminius or Salinus is quick to point out, you know, this is written in the 400s, slightly before this invasion. And this is what he says, is there's a, there's a lack of meaning of being Roman and chivalrousness or a, a honor. Uh, a, a great philosopher of known as... Um, He, he wrote, you know, about these types of things and the spirit of the laws. And his name, for some reason, is escaping me. I have no idea why. Uh, I'll look it up really quickly here. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm looking it up because I'm drawing a blank right now. And this is by Charles Charles Louis de Secondant Baron de Montesquieu. His full name. Some people just know him as Montesquieu. And what he said is there's three kinds of government. There's despotic, which in our case, in our example here, Caesar had become despotic, right? So the senators took him down. And there's a monarch and there's a republic. Well, the republic is what the Romans initially were. They uh you know, they were governed by a uh, governing body, not necessarily elected by the people, but cer certainly the wisest people in the government. Now, if, whether you want to agree to that is your decision. But we get to monarch and what Charles Louis de Secondant, uh, Baron of uh, de Montesquieu, he's the Baron of Montesquieu, this is his official, you know, most prestigious title. What he says is that monarch is garnered by false honor, and it's not necessarily false in that, uh, you know, certainly there's a different way of thinking it, but this honor rules the society, and with this honor, okay, and particularly this comes into play in Roman society, that honor, this honor, okay, is a way that keeps things in order, that people have to perform in a certain way, in a certain, hold themselves a certain way, they can't just do whatever they want. Uh, there's certain rules that govern society. And this honor, like virtue in a republic, he says, keeps the people in line and keeps the government flowing because, uh, you know, there's certain, you have to do things that perhaps aren't good for you personally, but protrude a certain honor. And this is what Arminianus Mercellinus writes. Rome still still looked upon as the queen of the earth, and the name of the Roman people is respected and venerated. But the magnif magnificence of Rome is def defaced by the inconsiderate levity of a few who never recollect where they are born, but fall away into air and licentiousness, as if perfect immunity were granted to vice. Now, what he's saying here is that Rome may still be, uh, from everybody else around the world, this great city where the, and the people of Rome are respected. But when he, he's an outsider from the eastern half of the empire, when he comes into Rome, essentially this is what he's doing, he calls it the luxury of the rich in Rome. And what he's basically saying is that there is no more honor in the city of life. On that note of honor... When we talk about honor, there's no more honor left to the empire. Uh, Marcellinius, um, Marcellinianus is basically describing a place where vice is the, uh, the Norman place in the Norman culture. And instead of 
the civic duty that existed before where people are uh you know they have a certain duty and they have a certain responsibility they feel they have this honor to fulfill that duty and what starts to happen is you know as we notice here as we talk about in the paper there's a physical manifestation of the troubles of rome and you know they simply aren't able to defend their borders anymore they increasingly lie on these uh these uh you know barbarians dramatic tribes people you know in 357 uh rome could stand on the field and and, pro and it project itself against against anyone in wind and by this time uh you know uh you know marcellinianess seems to seems to say that that uh these vices and these uh things of that nature that romans don't really you know they don't have that same honor about them whether whether it's their own doing or the empire starting to decline and this is just before you know um in 405 406 the invasion of italy you know where where uh rome is no longer defending itself against um you know by itself it has to rely on huns and allens and even uh, the you know, slaves to defend the empire and it has to recall these people from the fringes of the empire places like gaul and and other places to defend um you know pull what little resources it has to defend it and you know uh marcellinianus is writing about you know the luxury of the rich in rome just you know years prior to this uh you know invasion of italy it's it says that we we can't it's uh pro prophetic uh you know and these people that defend rome aren't necessarily treated the greatest it goes back to uh you know rome and uh rome had something earlier and it's uh, before that that uh, the, it's italian allies see rome was a uh, one people but there were many peoples of italy and they relied on their italian allies to help form the military and uh um you know but they didn't enjoy the same luxuries as romans even though they had been carrying the burden of empire and so many times the italian allies would rebel against uh romans for better rights and uh you know they would be promised better rights and it wasn't necessarily i'm not necessarily sure uh if they were delivered on that i i think perhaps they would have to eventually and here's the same case with barbarians they uh or dramatic peoples barbarians is actually kind of a derogatory term um and, and that is what it says is these people who uh you know are um they're they're good enough to carry the burden of the empire uh and many of them are rising to huge ranks within uh the roman military and other institutions but they they simply are not good enough to you know they're simply not good enough i mean like one of the observers here you know Indeed, as one observer noted, uh, this is Ward per Perkins, the death of a barbarian, uh, death of barbarians in Roman service thinned out potential future enemies of the empire. And yet, barbarians were extremely loyal to Romans, and, but it just shows the attitude that they would still have towards these people, and and they did need them to defend the empire. Rome, Rome wasn't glorious anymore. Rome didn't have the money or the things to control such a vast empire uh you know and so it they declined and and where does that leave us where does this leave the people where does this leave you know and and maybe it's it's uh uh we don't you know as as the paper we were talking about the paper that i wrote um, about ward perkins is he he wants to he doesn't necessarily say if there's one particular cause of the fall, and I don't think I have either. I'm just talking about a physical manifestation of the collapse of the empire. The physical manifestation is the Germanic invaders, um, who, uh, you know, obviously did invade and take over, but they weren't as uh, Germans were. Uh, they weren't as Romans referred to them as barbarians. Um, you know, they they actually helped to hold up the empire and uh, treated very badly 
But uh, let's not pretend that they sacked their way into uh, revitalizing Rome. Rome was on its way out. Um, and, you know, the, and there wasn't an antiquity, either, uh, late antiquity, as, uh, you know, Paul Brown, or I think his name was Paul Brand, would say. Uh, you know, they would replace words with decline. They'd put, like, you know, revitalized or... Other words like that to, to suggest, you know, a, a metamorphosis or words that just sort of suggest there was no decline. You have to address that there was a decline. And that's what Word Perkins's main argument is. And, you know, perhaps there are many reasons why Rome fell. Perhaps, you know, as, uh, as our main source here, uh, Marcellinianus, says, you know, that that Romans had neglected their civic duty, that perhaps it was more about the uh, vices of being Roman, and uh, in order to you know maintain that, you had to have your civic duty and your your honor. You know that it, maintaining an empire wasn't an easy thing. You know they, the Italians couldn't go into field of battle anymore. They they, they simply did. You know uh, they simply didn't have the skills to. You know, avoiding battle led to a slow attrition of the Roman positions. But engaging the enemy, this is Ward Perkins, on a large scale, w uh, would have risked immediate dis disaster on the throw of a dice. So they just simply, they couldn't really predict whether they would win a battle or not. But, but you know... Um, just just to look at it, I'm not going to give you the answer of why the Romans fell. That's for yourself to find out. You can read Ward Perkins' book. I'm sure you could find it. I think it's called The Fall of Rome. It's it's very short. Uh, very. Um, you won't probably understand who the, all the peoples are, you know, the Visigoths and other peoples, but it perhaps give you an inside guide to the fall of Rome. So anyway, this is James signing off and saying good luck.